Imagine being able to expand your revenues, expand your impact by doing more of the things you love to do the best. Hey, it's Melanie Benson Strick here, and I'm America's leading small business optimizer. And this weekly podcast series is all about learning from other extraordinary entrepreneurs and talented creative visionaries. What are the small changes they've made that have helped them optimize their business so it works 10 times better? And today's guest is someone who's very near and dear to my heart, someone who uh, I believe has really tapped into the secrets of leverage and keeps looking at ways to increase leverage in his life and his business. He's constantly looking for more ways to get more done. And I've asked our guest here today, Evan Mark Katz, to share a bit about his journey. And how do you go from being uh, feeling like you're up against the wall, you're overwhelmed, you're kind of tapped out and being able to grow, but you have so much more you want to do? And what worked for him uh, as he made these shifts and he's willing to, to go there and go deep and share some of his own personal experiences along the way? So let me tell you a little bit about our guest, Evan Mark Katz. Um, Evan is billed as a personal trainer for smart, strong, successful women. I don't know any of those. <laughs> He's a dating coach. Uh, Evan Mark Katz has been helping women like you find love since 2003. And Evan can be found at evanmarkkatz.com. It's on your screen here. But also know that the K in Mark is with a C. Or sorry, the K. <laughs> the Mark is with a C, not with a K. So welcome, Evan. Thank you for coming and joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, so, you know, just on a personal note, Evan and I have known each other a long time. We actually originally met uh, at the beginning of all social media, MySpace. I love that we met on MySpace. Well, <laughs> so I, I think the way you, you, you're, you, you say it like that, it sounds, it sounds cheesier than it actually was. <laughs> it's not it was like you met on really MySpace cool in a then. dating capacity. You, you had a free offer for your get out of overwhelm uh, CD or something like that and I downloaded it and I said oh my god she's talking to me <laughs> I'm overwhelmed I don't have enough time I'm not growing the business the way I want and I got I got hooked on your your materials and so you know uh, to have this conversation about how I've changed my business without giving uh, proper deference to the person who helped me do it would be you know wouldn't paint the whole picture you, you know you're a big reason that I make three times more money than I did when I met you. Oh, well, that is very kind of you to point out, and I love that you have really put all this into action. So let's start with just a little bit of background, and you have a passion for doing something that you kind of fell into uh, from a very uh, fun way, I think. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what was the catalyst for you to become an online dating coach? Um, I mean that's and that's really where it started was online, um, but I'm not an online dating coach. I'm I'm really just I'm, I'm a, a specific I'm okay. specifically a coach for women who want to fall in love. Okay. Um, and uh, I was a screenwriter in Los Angeles. Um, you know, more successful than 95 percent of the screenwriters in town, but not as successful as the five percent that I needed to be. And when I turned 30, I, I said I don't want to be the 40 year old guy who's who's trying to sell a screenplay. I got to figure something out. And so I went to film school. Um, I was going to be a professor, you know, those who can't teach. <laughs> and so I was like, all right, I'll, I'll be a screenwriting professor. It's all good. I got a day job to support myself while I was on student loans. And that day job was answering phones at JDate, uh, the online dating company for Jewish people. And after nine months of doing it, I realized, oh, my God, I know more about online dating than any of the people I'm talking to on the phone in customer service. Um, I should write a book because that's what writers do. We write. And so I wrote a book about online dating in 2003 called I Can't Believe I'm Buying This Book, A Common Sense Guide to Successful Internet Dating. And uh, for the first time in my career, I had timing on my side. Uh, I was never particularly lucky in Hollywood, but I got very lucky with that book because it was when online dating was going mainstream. And so suddenly, you know, I'm doing, you know, CNN and, and uh, Fox News and, uh, and Review and Time Magazine, USA Today. And... I was like, all right, I'm going to drop out of film school and see where this online dating thing goes. Mm. And um, uh, online, that online dating book led to a business called E. Cyrano, uh, writing people's online dating profiles. People's online dating profiles turned out so well, they said, this is great, I'm getting all this attention, what do I do now? And I said, well, what do you mean, what do you do now? You, you flirt. How do I do that? 
So I would go on to Mesh.com with people and help them flirt. <laughs> and, and they'd say, oh my, this is great. And suddenly they're going on first dates and my first dates aren't going so well. What do I do now? And so it, my business growth was completely organic, um, being responsive to the needs of the people who were reaching out to me. They may have come to me for one reason, mm -hmm. but their needs were far greater than that. So I developed a whole suite of services to address my client's core needs. So it went from online dating profiles to online dating coaching to dating coaching, upon which I realized that 80% of the people who were coming to me were the same person. It was smart, strong, successful women. So I just narrowed my brand in 2010 to address the, you know, the 80% of the people who were already coming my way. So it was this, it's been a 10 year, very organic journey but for the first six years of it, it was just one-on-one -on -one, you know, private coaching. And my only way of growing my business was to raise my prices. I didn't have the, you know, the, the outside perspective or the business acumen to, to really leverage my time better. Yeah. And I, and I remember you know, when we were working together, and still as we continue to, we, we hang out now, and we're, we're almost neighbors, so it's almost like we, we get that great opportunity here in Los Angeles to see each other regularly. Um, but you know, I know there's, uh, there's two things I want to ask you about this. First of all, I, I have to give you a huge compliment. You're one of the best writers I've ever known, and, and you are so fun and so talented, and you're, you're edgy, and you're willing to go into these really, like these crevices that, that people try to steer away from and it just it makes what you do so so enjoyable and there's been so many times I forwarded your newsletters to my my now my single friends but at the time I was single too and it's just it's great writing I highly recommend you guys check them out I appreciate but, that you know, you, you have a really unique thing in that you get what you do and you do it well but was there a time when you know you you solve a certain problem for women. You know, they want to fall in love, they want to meet someone, but was there a pivotal problem that you learned how to solve for them that helped catapult your success along? It's, um, I, like, I like these questions. I mean, I, you sent me some questions that I was going to answer, but what I like about them in particular is that they're so different than the questions I normally answer when yeah. I do interviews, <laughs> which are always dating related. <laughs> it, it does make me think, because I don't have pat answers. I'm not saying these things every day. so. Um, I think there are, are two things that help me, I don't know if this is the answer to your question or just the answer that I want to give. Go for it. There are two things that really helped me define what I do better and define my brand. And one of them was getting married. Mm. Um, and I gave relationship advice for, you know, five, six years before I was married, right? That was, that was my strength. Uh, the, the subtitle on my blog was, who knows more about dating than a guy who's still dating? So that was my strength. I'm out there doing the same thing. Um, but people see you differently when you're married. And marriage sort of coalesced all the things that were bouncing around my head and helped me create almost a unified theory of how this whole thing works. Mm -hmm. So then I could go backwards and reverse engineer it. Okay, here's what I went through in online dating dating relationships. Here are the things that I struggled with. I'm very much like my smart, strong, successful clients. I really, really understand them. So by ultimately having success and persevering after 300 dates, I was able to retroactively look back and say, what did I do that worked and create a system around that. So marriage was really a pivotal point for me to uh, figure it all out. And then I also realized my unique value proposition, if you will, was that I was about the only guy who was doing this. Right? Most of the people who give dating relationship advice are women who give advice to women. Or in the other world, it's men who give it, pick up advice to men. It, that's not right. And it's just objectively not right. If I'm a man and I want to do well with women, I should probably ask a woman. <laughs> really? I yeah, mean, that's a good point. And so I you know, I joke that I, I, I'm, you know, I was number one in a field of one. I found, I found the thing that I did that nobody else did. You want to understand guys? Talk to a guy. And I think those two things helped me define what it is that I do that's different than everybody else and gave it a, a much stronger voice. Yeah. And, and so I know there's one thing that you put out that um, I think was a real pivotal moment for you as well, which you, you mentioned some of your other books, but then you created an online uh, product that was one of the biggest problems that especially women like me were facing 
and that was why he disappears, right? Well, well, let's uh, let's go let's go backwards because before there was a why he disappeared. Uh, this was and this is under your tutelage, and so I don't want to I don't want to glide past it. I was stuck in this hourly coaching model. I knew my material cold, right? But I there's only so many hours in a day. There's only so so many people you could talk to. There's only so high you could raise your prices. Mm -hmm. And so it was under your watch that I got my first virtual assistant and probably the next six. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of turnover in those early years. So I got my first virtual assistant when I was working under you to so create more time and leverage. And I created my first product in, in 2008, which is the year that I got married. Right? And I launched the product uh, right before I got married and went on my honeymoon and I, did a, I tied it all together. And I paid for my Melanie Benson Strict coaching with one, you know, one thirty thousand dollar product mm -hmm. launch later. Um, and I and I had a, a a product called Finding the One Online, which is an online dating audio series, seven hours of audio, hundred eighty page transcript, thirty five page workbook, and it was all the thing I was doing on the phone, and that was all collated into one place that could make me some money in my sleep. So that was the first product I ever did, and that was specifically thanks to you. And let's pause there for a second because this is a it was a really pivotal moment for you. You had a challenge where you were running out of time, you were running out of uh, you know. Uh, patience, if you will, <laughs> with how to fix this problem. You know, I remember actually you were, you joke around about this, but you know you being on a beach in Hawaii with your wife and you you realizing like, okay, I want to I want to do this thing. You know, I want to I want to. Oh, when shift I signed this. when I signed up to work yeah. with you. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I again, I'm completely transparent about it. I signed up for something free. We like free things. I signed up for your free offer to get out of overwhelm, and I said, I like this woman. I, I think she gets it. She gets my unique dilemma because it's not that unique. And, um, but I felt like you were talking to me. So I signed up for your, your, your fast track program. It was 297 or 397 at the time or whatever it was. And I, after two months in there, I said, I want more personal attention. I need more, more, more. And so that's when I was, I was on vacation with my fiance and I had to decide, was I gonna step up to Melanie's highest level of coaching, which was a big financial leap for me. Um, and it was scary to spend money that I had but didn't have that much of uh, under the guise that if I do this it'll make me more in the long run and, and sure enough that it did and, and every time I've ever taken the leap to invest heavily in myself it's always paid off. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great point. I'm glad you put, put that out because I think a lot of people get nervous about investing in themselves and you know, a pivotal moment for you was making the commitment to invest in yourself and getting advice that was outside of your normal day-to-day -day training. And I, I think we all benefit when we do that. So, so you're facing the challenge of being overwhelmed. We look at the leverage strategy. So the leverage strategy, let's talk about that for a second. You wanted to do more of what you enjoyed the most, which is what? What is it that you enjoyed the most that you wanted to leverage? Well, that's, uh, that, that, rem that remains something that's an issue for me because the thing that I like to do the most, I do the least. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I didn't build this business with a, with a plan. It's just sort of constantly morphing and changing. For me, I come alive when I'm, when I'm speaking, when I'm coaching, when I'm talking to people. Uh, I'm a writer by trade. I enjoy it. Um, but... Uh, you know, my, my goal wasn't to spend more time writing. It was it, it was really just to to uh, be able to make more money, free up my time, and have you know what they call you know the, the lifestyle business and have a very balanced life. And um, to this day, um, I have a great lifestyle business that's on an upswing where I work nine to five Monday through Friday. I don't work nights. I don't work weekends. Um, I don't take client calls in the morning. Um, I, you know, I'm very much uh, the master of my domain and kind of work on my own terms. Um, and uh, right now, as I mentioned before the call, 60% of my revenue comes from coaching, 40% comes from products, and uh, I'm in a process of, of you know, reversing that. Uh, I'm going to spend a lot more time writing for the next year to create more passive revenue so that I could create uh, greater coaching offerings um, that free up my time even more. 
So let's talk about a couple turning points for you. Uh, one was, as you mentioned, you know, getting help and getting hiring and learning how to leverage your time. But the second one was really getting a signature offering. And I think that's a leverage point that a lot of people oftentimes don't understand. When you leverage your talent and your knowledge in a way that is so unmistakably, like it's rich for your audience. You, you For me, it was that get out of overwhelm product for you. Um, you know, uh, the name of the book is jumping out of my head, but you had, you created that why, why he disappeared, like you yeah. mentioned earlier. Yeah. yeah. And, and then so, you created a coaching program around it. Um, why he disappeared uh, is, you know, and, and again, I, I, I botched the story last time I told it, but you were the one who told me to write why he disappeared. If you could explain why guys disappear, you'll be very, very successful. You told me to do that. And I said, okay, I don't have to look hard for a title. <laughs> Why yeah, that was a great title. <laughs> and so that gave me focus. And I, so I just started to think, all right, what, what are the reasons that men like me don't stick around with certain women? And I had enough history to draw upon as a single guy and as a coach. Yeah. Why do men disappear from the first date? Why do men disappear during the, the courtship process, first date, second date, third date, um, to the point of being a boyfriend? And then why do men disappear from relationships? And so the book sort of just wrote itself. Um, it wasn't hard to create the book because I was a writer. The hard part was to create the launch strategy so that it could make a lot of money. And that, that took me a couple, almost a couple of years to get right. Um, I had the book, but I, didn't, I couldn't sell it. Uh, and you know and I know that there are no shortage of people out there. And, and, and I, I really want to say this to a business coaching audience because I usually talk to a dating audience. Everybody who, who's, who you've ever listened to <laughs> has taught you the wrong way to do it. <laughs> and I don't know what you teach, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of plant a flag and say everybody's doing it backwards. Tell us what everybody, did work then. This, I'm real, I want to know too. Everybody starts with the book. Yes. I wrote this book. Now who you're selling it to? I, you know, I, as a friend, right, as an entrepreneur, I've coached friends right, on a more diluted level than you do who've seen my success. I had a friend who was a yoga instructor and she said, but you know, I'm in LA and I have to do a, a DVD because all the top yoga instructors have a DVD and so I need something to sell. I said, okay, you can invest $5,000 in making your own yoga DVD after one year of yoga practice and you could sell it to your 15 students, right, for 20 bucks and you just made $350. Ta-da. So you have a product, but who are you selling it to? Who's your audience? What's your brand? So I did one thing accidentally right. <laughs> That's why I'm, I have to be humble about this thing that I did right. I built a brand, a system, and an audience before I launched the book. I had a mailing list of 10,000 people plus. I had a blog readership of hundreds of thousands of people, right, in advance because I was practicing, talking to people on the phone every day, coming up with ideas, creating more and more material. So the more material you have, the more you do the on the ground coaching, the more you find your voice, the more you build up brand loyalty, mm -hmm. bigger readership. So when I finally launched Why He Disappeared in 2010, right, I had someone to sell to. I did an internal launch, right, that made great money. And then three months later, I did a Jeff Walker Formula JV launch that exploded my entire business. Right? Because I already had the audience. And so many people write the ebook and they, and they put it up on their website. They say, How can nobody ever buy my ebook? Well, it's just sitting on your website. It's just sitting there. Why are they going to buy from you? Have they been reading your blog for years? Have they been reading your newsletter for years? Why? And I, I just think it's really important to, to get really good at what you do first. And again, this is my accident. I did so much coaching before I productized that it served me actually really well. But if you're really impatient saying, I'm going to create a product, I need leverage, I want to make passive income, you create the product, it's not as good as if you wrote the product in a year from now, right? If you just do it fast. And I, I think it, it often is a disservice to people to try to productize before they're even solid practitioners of their craft. I would totally agree with you. And, you know, in, in my strategy, the thing that I look at is you're doing something really well and now you're so maxed out, you can't do any more of it to grow. And that's the time to really bring the leverage and the productization and look for ways to monetize the thing you do well. And I, I did the same journey you did where I got so 
busy. <laughs> I was totally maxed out coaching wise and I'd figured out what I was doing. And then I was looking at like, now how do I like streamline it? So I totally mm -hmm. agree with you. Yeah. So other people try to sell the ebook before they have an audience, before they have a mm -hmm. practice. And it's, it's really, I, I would, I would just, I would just write, I would write and I would coach and set low prices and establish your, your place in the marketplace and, and just get people to like you and trust you. And like anything you do in life, whoever is listening to this, whatever you've been doing as your regular job for five, 10 years, you're probably pretty good at it. And you're probably a lot better now than the day you started. So there, yeah. there's, this, there's this, you know, this idea that we need to fast forward to get to the end. And sometimes I think it's it's worth it to go through the, the, the process and the struggle. Yeah, I think there's there's always value in the process. I think how long we suffer with the problem yes. <laughs> is is up to you. You know, you, you you can make choices that will eliminate some of that suffering earlier. But sure. be, being in the suffering is what's the catalyst to say I need to find a better way to do it. So True. speaking of better ways to do it, you know, having gone through this journey, is there something that like a technique or a strategy that you learned along the way to run your business better that maybe you wish you would have done sooner if you'd known about it? Um, in the dating and relationship niche, and as we've come to know each other better, you've gotten to meet some of the, the other people. Mm -hmm. None of us are great business people naturally. That's why we were drawn to dating and relationships. We're, we're people people. We believe in love and authentic communication, right? We're not uh, like we ended up here for sort of the right reasons, but there's very few people who are very successful at this. And the people who are the most successful are the ones who found an all-in-one web team, right? Um, and it's not the only way to do it, um, uh, but I was trying it. I was trying it your way, and I wanted to do it your way. I didn't succeed, which does not mean your way was wrong. I wasn't able to make it successful. My hiring just failed. I wasn't a good leader. I wasn't a good delegator. There was a tremendous amount of turnover. We didn't have great systems. Um, it took a long time until I found a web team who could do everything for me and take a percentage of my net profits in order to do so. And the people in the dating niche who are the most successful all have web teams who take about 20% of their revenue and do everything for them. Uh, David Wygant, Marty Batista, and everybody else is just sort of scuffling along. Yeah. Right? So it's basically like do... you have somebody who's your partner in the result. Exactly, because everybody else, you know, suddenly they're not dating coaches. They're worried about click throughs and conversions and web design and systems. And it's just not their thing. Yeah. And so for me, the big thing was getting my web team in 2010, which is what allowed me to launch why he disappeared. Because I could create all the products in the world. But if I can't get them out there and do something with good graphic design and password protection and a clean download page and optimized sales page and you, you need people who really know what they're doing and they exist, but it's, it's kind of hard to find. And yet there's, it's, it's almost like dating. Everything's a dating metaphor for me. So it was just a lot of trial and error and failure for you know, about you know, three years after I knew you until I found the guys who could execute this. Yeah. And, you know, I think some people don't know they need that until they've tried hiring maybe one or two people and they sure. realize that's not for me. And there's um, there's a lot of different models that are out there. As a matter of fact, after um, myself and many other people went through the frustrations of trying to figure out how to manage people, we, we I don't know if you know this, but we actually enhanced the Build Your Dream Team program to teach that model because you're right, there's a lot of benefit to having a partner who takes on that piece rather than trying to manage it when it's not your area of expertise. So that's a really, I'm glad you shared that one because I think there's a lot of our energy that goes into trying to figure things out that we're not good at. And when we don't have to try to figure that out anymore and we can just focus more on the thing that you're meant to do, you feel liberated from it and it allows you to be more successful and have more bandwidth for what you do do well. Yeah, so, so that, that was a, a, a huge thing was finding the team that could allow me to execute my dream and my vision. Um, even still, it's frustrating. Uh, they, they're strapped. They don't have enough time. They don't have enough people working under them. And so um, this, is, this is a sort of universal dilemma, whatever business you're in, unless you're really good at scaling, you're going to get stuck doing too many things, right? Be, being a doer, uh, one of the things I quote you on regularly is, are you working in your business or on your business? And um, I spent so much time working in my business, uh, doing what comes naturally, that I'm at a point actually right now 
where I almost have to break it apart again to make it better. Um, I have now, thanks to you, uh, created so many things. Um, I've got Why He Disappeared uh, ebook, uh, Finding the One Online audio series. I've got a monthly membership called Focus Coaching, which is uh, a, a member site with hundreds of smart, strong, successful women supporting each other in an online forum. Each month, there's a, there's a, a, a lecture and a Q&A around a specific dating topic. I've got a 12-person group called the Inner Circle for group coaching. I do uh, 9 to 12 hours of private coaching each week. I write two blogs and one newsletter a week. And I'm prolific and I'm successful and I don't have a spare second to myself. And so Plus you have I two little to, kids. <laughs> another story altogether. But the two little kids is, is basically what forces me to not be a workaholic mm -hmm. and say, I'm getting out of the office at 530. Work will be there tomorrow. But I've overcommitted my time to things that I have to be doing because I am consistent and I have a good work ethic and it's not hard for me, it's pleasurable. But I've sort of overcommitted and spread myself too thin. So now I'm committed to taking on fewer clients and spending more time writing to create another product that's going to create more passive revenue and give me more leverage and free up more and more time so that I'm not doing, doing, doing. I went to the library twice in the past three weeks to think for three hours. And it was the greatest thing I'd done in three years. Giving myself three hours to think because I haven't given it to myself before. Just so creating space. So it sounds like that's a, you know, I like to look at what are the ahas that we have as we continue to evolve. You know, you, we, we, we go through phases of growing our business. And it sounds like right now the aha is that by taking space just to be and not do, you actually create more clarity to propel yourself forward. It's easy to fill yourself up with stuff. There's always so email true. to answer. You can always screw around on Facebook or Twitter. There's always stuff you can do. But when you do enough of this business coaching um, and you try to internalize some of it, Am I doing my most important work early, getting something important done every day? Am I blocking out everything and focusing instead of, you know, pseudo multitasking, which means getting nothing done? Uh, and I still have days where it's like one o'clock, it's time to eat lunch, and I'm like, I'm not even sure what the hell I did today. It happens, but I'm getting better and better at time blocking, what you call ruthless time management. Um, and uh, I'm seeing a clear path to the future of my business and where it can go. Uh, trying to map out a strategy for all of 2014 right now. Uh, and just thinking and saying, okay, here, here are my goals, here are my deadlines, I'm gonna execute. Instead of sort of lurching back and forth and just doing the daily tasks to keep the lights on. Yeah. And uh, when you overcommit yourself to things, and I would say the same thing about dating and relationships. All right. Single people in their 40s and 50s have rich, full lives. They work, they have their friends, they have their hobbies, they, they do yoga, they go on retreats, they do all these things, and then there's no time for dating. All right. And so how are you going to fall in love if you never date? How am I going to create these great leveraged offers if I'm so overcommitted to writing and coaching? I'm not going to be able to create anything if I'm doing, doing, doing. So that's been a big epiphany within the past you know, five months for me. This is, a, this is such a beautiful point you're making because a lot of people get busy and they aren't putting any energy into thing that will actually deliver the result they most want. I love to use the dating analogy because it's so true. You get busy with your life, with your kids, with whatever you're doing and you don't make time. You're not going to actually have someone just poof show up from in yep. there. It's the same thing in your business. If you don't put your time and energy into the things that will directly impact and generate the results you want, you won't get them. So knowing what those are and creating space for them is a great reminder for everyone to, to, to tap into. So and I think it's hard. I think it's hard if you're a workaholic like I am, like a reasonable one. But you know, I don't feel I don't feel good unless I'm sitting in front of my computer for ten hours a day. I know people who like they take walks and they need fresh air and they go to Starbucks and. I never leave my house. I have to be here or I'm not working. Right. And I've been that way since I was a screenwriter 15 years ago. If, if I don't sit in front of my computer, nothing gets done. And I've created a sort of barrier because I, I started to believe that that's true and it's not true. I could get something done sitting at the library, staring at the ceiling, taking down notes. And that's 
strangely a revelation I'd had 10 years into doing this. Did you actually call yourself a reasonable workaholic? Yes. <laughs> I've never heard that before. <laughs> how do you well, make, how, I, how does I, a reasonable I have, workaholic? I, 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 don't, I don't take, I don't go out to lunch with people. I've never watched daytime TV. I get into the office at, at five. I'm done at 5.30. So I am, I am. You're disciplined. I, I, yeah, I wouldn't call discipline. that a workaholic. I would say you yeah, and no, I are so similar that Yeah, workaholic is the people who are, who are, you know, you know, they're doing it at midnight and leaving their weekends. And, right. But, but, but I have a, a clear work ethic that, because I am my business, it's evanmarkcats.com. If I don't do it, it doesn't get done. And I take that responsibility very, very seriously. As a screenwriter years ago, I wrote 13 screenplays and 15 sitcoms in seven or eight years. I knew people who called themselves screenwriter, they were tinkering with one screenplay for four years, <laughs> right? And so it's, it's you know, I'm a, I'm a get her done guy, right? Yeah, I, I, I took one of your live seminars, right? I discovered that I was red energy. Yeah, you're all about right? results. Yeah, just, just plow through, get her done. And that is a strength and it's also a weakness when you get so focused on the doing that you don't take the time to think and create and breathe and see the big picture. Love that. I love that you brought that up. So do you have a mantra or a quote that's really helps you stay connected to what's important to you as you're building your business? Uh, it's funny you should say that because you know me, I'm, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a mantra kind of guy. I'm not an affirmations kind of guy. Um, but there are two quotes that are sort of guiding lights for me. Uh, in business and in love. Um, uh, one of them is, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? Love that one. What would you do if you I, knew you couldn't fail? Okay, I love that one. All right, so you're always presuming the answer is yes. I could do anything. All right, I'm not worried about failure, ever. Um, I was out with uh, someone from my, my university alumni office yesterday, and I'm talking about speaking and doing things for the university to try to inspire people. and. Um, I said that my greatest fear was that I was going to be like my best friend who's a lawyer who's 41 years old and is working 14 hours a day. Wow. Right? I wasn't afraid of falling on my ass as a screenwriter. I was afraid of wearing a suit and working until 10 o'clock at night and not being with my family. Mm. I was afraid of that. So I've never been afraid of failure and I failed a lot, but I've never been afraid of that failure. I was afraid of a kind of success that I didn't want to have. Um, so what would you do if you knew you could not fail? The other quote is currently escaping me, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> I'm creating a new product, right? It, mm -hmm. it's, a new, it's a new mindset product to help women um, uh, get past that why bother feeling. I hate dating, I hate men, I hate Los Angeles, I hate Match.com. And I'm mm -hmm. creating a whole product around reframing the negative thinking and, and finding your confidence and your swagger and getting back on the horse and getting out there. I love so, it. So um, again, it's, it's, I don't come up with these ideas. It's, this is what people tell me that they need. So I just create what they need. So, um, so I, was, I had the, what would you do if you knew you, you knew you could not fail in my head? Will you indulge me and give me a half a second? Because I'm going to find the other quote. I know we're live, but, but it's, it's important. And I want to get it right. Um, give me a half a second because I have it up here. What would you do if you knew you could not fail? And the only risk is the one not taken. Yeah, that's a good one too. I like right? that. It's always worth it to take the chance. Just not in, not in the spiritual way the universe will provide, but in a very, very practical way. If you stay in your safe job that you don't like, you're not going to like it two years from now. If you're in a dead-end relationship with a guy who's never going to marry you and there's poor communication but you're afraid of being alone, get rid of him. Right? Always, always take the risk. Right? Because if the status quo is dissatisfying, the risk is the only thing you could do. I love it. That's so great. And same with your business. You know, take the risk to create what you want you know, people get so caught up in what if I fail? What if it doesn't work? So what? Where you are isn't all that great either. So let's let's at least move towards the direction you want. A friend of mine has a saying, uh, shoot for the moon. And even if you land on the stars, you're still in a better place than you are right now. 
Absolutely. And I, I, actually, I literally was talking about that last night when I was talking about my friend who's the lawyer. I said, I wanted to be Judd Apatow. I want to be the screenwriter who made everybody in Hollywood laugh and could get every mo movie made. I aim for that. I fell short. But I landed here. I'm living a really, really cool plan B right now where most people I know are down here because they never aimed up here. Yeah. So I, I, I completely concur. And uh, when you look at, and I remember you doing something years ago with the the, the mindset of, of billionaires and things like that, they're all risk takers, mm -hmm. all of them. Absolutely. So Evan, just out of curiosity, would we know any of the, would we have seen any of the scripts you've written or any of the, uh, give, can you give us one that we might have ran into in our travels? Now, now that, that's, again, that's sort of why I got out. I was the most successful, unsuccessful uh, writer in town. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 won, I won awards. I had agents and managers, met at every studio and network. Um, the only thing that regular people would have heard of was that in 2000, I finished in the top three in Matt Damon and Ben Affleck's Project Greenlight contest. Oh, how cool. I didn't know you were in that. Yeah, so they, there was 7,500 scripts. I finished uh, in the top three. And I was on HBO and all this kind of stuff. And Matt Damon said, dude, you're really talented. You know, we're the same age. You know, he's like, I'm going to be working for you one day. Gave me his email address. Stay in touch. Do you still have his never, email address? <laughs> yes. Never heard from <laughs> him awesome. again. Never heard from him again. Which does not mean that I have any animosity as much as guy had bigger fish to fry than keeping right. in touch with the struggling screenwriter and taking care of him. Yeah. And... Um, and so, so yeah, I, I came really close to the top of the mountain. I never got over the hump. I don't blame anybody for it. Hollywood's a pretty tough business. Yeah. Um, and so I, I'm just really grateful that I found something where I could channel my creative energies, uh, be myself for a living. I, I, there's no, you know, I have no pretense. I have no filter. It's just really easy for me to do this job authentically and help people authentically on my own terms. And so here's one other really great idea and I use it in dating but it's a career mm -hmm. idea as well um, it's really important to be able to give up your dreams in order to get happy Ooh, that's so, juicy Evan so my, my dream was being a screenwriter that was my whole identity from 20 to 30 like I had no resume you know to this day I can't make an Excel spreadsheet I'm useless so I had this dream and it was a self-defining dream. This is what I am, this is what I must do. But the dream was making me miserable. Mm. That, was the, that was the irony. And this is what happens again, I, 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 this is a business thing, but, but it happens in dating. You have the idea, you've made your vision board of the guy you think you're looking for and you get so attached to the idea that he's gonna be six feet tall, make $250,000 a year, he's gonna have the same religious beliefs, he's gonna be spiritual and sensitive and well-read and you create this avatar of a human being and you never find them and you're unhappy because <laughs> you boxed yourself into this very, very narrowly defined dream. And the second I gave up screenwriting, it opened up the entire world to me. So you have to be able to give up your dream if your dream is not making you happy. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. That is so powerful. That's going to be one of my favorite new quotes that I write down and, uh, and I use for uh, Twitter. So I'll be giving you credit for that. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, and I, I, I never thought of it like a quote. I haven't really refined it, but I, I realize, and, and you know my wife, she wasn't what I was looking for, right? I was looking for X. And once I let go of what I was looking for, I found a greater happiness than I ever thought I could have. So that's what happens when you're really open instead of so focused on it's it's this or bust yeah right and you're attached uh, and you're attached to yeah. having to look and, that and, way it's sort of you gave me a you know the law of attraction cd and i'm not that big on it but one of the things that i am big on is the idea of going with the flow and swimming dr downstream mm -hmm. is this natural is it coming easy to me yeah. right being evan marquette's dating coach is easier for me than being evan marquette's screenwriter i'm sticking with it That's people awesome. ask me are you going to go back and write more no I'm happy. <laughs> My screenwriting made me miserable. This is awesome. This has been so great. Thank you, Evan. So, Evan Mark Katz, and that's Mark with a C, uh, dot com. And, Evan, really quick, can you tell us what's next for you? What's something new and exciting that's going to be coming our way? Um, uh, I have been working for two years on relaunching my two established brands. Uh, EvanMarkCats.com and eCyrano.com. That's E-C-Y-R-A-N-O. 
Uh, East Cerno is the online dating profile writing site that I started in 2003. Uh, Evan Mark Katz is the home of everything. We've got a million and a half uh, blog readers each year. Um, and I produce new content two, three times every week. And we're relaunching that site, I think, on November 1st. Uh, East Cerno will be a soft launch around the same time. And then in the new year, I'm hopefully going to have that mindset product for women to help awesome. women overcome their frustration and negativity and, and get back to dating in a confident, positive way. That's great. I can't wait to have it. So I'd love to hear your comments from today. You've been listening in to Evan share his own journey and some great insights that, that parallel really business and love relationships. We'd love to hear your comments. Feel free to share them below. Spread the love. Tell people all about it. If you love this on iTunes today, you know, tell us what you think. We again, it's just great to hear from you. I'd like to know what you're, what's landing for you. And most importantly, you know, what can you take from what we talked about today to help you optimize your own business? So. Uh, again, thank you, Evan. I'm Melanie Benson Strick, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week for a brand new show. Bye, everybody. Bye.